This is Q on CBC Radio 1 across Canada, Sirius 137 across North America, and on television on Bold TV, Friday, Saturday, Tuesday nights. If you saw your future, what would you do about it? That's the central question in what some critics are calling the best new show on TV. It's called Flash Forward. It's a science fiction thriller based on a novel by Canadian author Robert J. Sawyer. The series, the series stars Joseph Fiennes. It follows the aftermath of a mysterious global event in which everyone on Earth loses consciousness for 2 minutes and 17 seconds. The blip causes the majority to experience visions of their lives six months into the future, while others mysteriously see nothing at all. So during that two, two minutes, 17 seconds, where everyone loses consciousness, they're seeing the future. After just a single episode, two uh, TV journalists and viewers are trumpeting Flash Forward as innovative, addictive, and the new lost. That might be uh, gratifying news to my next guest, though he's no stranger to accolades. The author of 20 novels, Robert Sawyer, is the only Canadian to win all three of the world's top science fiction awards for the best novel of the year, The Hugo, The Nebula, and the John W. Campbell Memorial Award. But as prescient as his fiction can be, the Mississauga, Ontario-based writer might not have predicted 10 years after Flash Forward was published in 1999, it would come to life with this impact. Robert J. Sawyer, a.k.a. the Dean of Canadian Science Fiction, joins me live in Studio Q. Hello, sir. Good morning, John. There's your formal intro. You watched this first episode with fans in Winnipeg. That's right. On, uh, on Thursday night. What Absolutely. Was, what was that experience to being like? scheduled, I'd already committed to Thin Air, the Winnipeg International Writers Festival. So Thursday, the 24th of September, turned out to be a date I was going to be in Winnipeg. Uh, we set up a big screen, actually a projection TV, at McNally Robinson in Winnipeg. 150 fans came out to watch it with me. And, I, you know, I do a lot of public speaking over the years. A novelist, you can't avoid that. I'm never nervous except that night. Had you seen it? I had seen it, but I had seen it, you know, in a, in a screening room, me and my wife in Los Angeles. Right. And this was the first time seeing it with an audience. But they laughed in the right places, they gasped in the right places, they applauded in the right places. And at the end of the evening, of course, I was quite relaxed because we all thought we had a hit on our hands. It was clear after seeing it with an audience that we really, really do. Based on the way the, the Winnipeg The response, yes. And then the overnight ratings we just killed. So. Well, yeah, yeah, it's a it's a remarkable piece of work. Thanks. I, 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 as I was telling you, as we just went to air here again, I, 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 it's very, very strong, uh, although also uh, very creepy. Uh, you know, it, it, I, I was anxious watching it. It was, it was, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's a thriller. Um, some writers just let go, as you know, Robert, for reasons of self-protection when their work is optioned for film or TV. How involved were you in this? You know, before they had actually optioned it, David Goyer and Brandon Braga, who wrote the pilot script, met with me in Los Angeles and started pitching me on how they would adapt it, which is very unusual. The normal thing is you secure the rights and then you ignore the writer. Mm -hmm. These guys wanted to make sure I would be comfortable from the get-go with what they were going to do. And I, I have been comfortable. I'm consultant on every episode. Uh, I even have a little cameo in the pilot. Uh, I was just talking to David Goyer this morning about my next trip down to L.A. I'm writing one of the episodes episodes this season. So it's a little bit different from the book. It is. Right? It is different from the book, which is great because the book will have a life of its own. I never, the, the worst thing that can happen to an author is when a movie, which is all, or a TV show, which is always going to have a bigger audience than a book, supplants mm. the book. That's the worst thing that can happen. So here's the version you should see. The novel Flash Forward and the TV series Flash Forward are you know, in physics, we talk about branching timelines. We have divergent realities here. People can go and enjoy my book, and it's getting a huge new lease on life because of the publicity, and also go and separately enjoy the TV series. And you've that's successfully, the perfect combination. You've successfully sold the TV series and the book. That's my in job. Because conversation. Because I own a piece of both, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you own a piece of your book. That's good to know. It, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. You, <laughs> You've said you were very prote protective, having said all of this, of the underlying philosophy of the show, can you describe that philosophy? That's right. The show, the novel, is about fate versus free will, about whether if ha armed with foreknowledge of your future, you could defeat your destiny, outwit your destiny. And I wanted to make sure when, when Brandon and David were saying, here's what we want to do, that they weren't going to lose that in the shuffle. The details of a particular setting, a particular character, that doesn't really matter. But the fact that's, that this was going to engage with a really fundamental philosophical question, I wanted to be assured that they were going to do that, and they are. They already have in the pilot, and they continue to do it throughout this the This question, flash forward, yeah. as opposed to flashback. Yes. Flash forward, that the idea of displacing 
waste time, lost and recovered. What intrigues you about seeing into the future while you're in the present? Everybody, when they're in the present, looking back at the past, has regrets. They made stupid mistakes, stupid investments, uh, maybe a bad relationship, maybe a bad career choice. And we all think, had we had foreknowledge of how the future was going to unfold, we could have avoided that. Right. And this, this thought experiment has captivated me for over a decade now. Is that really true? My little tiny test for everybody is here we are at the end of September. Ask yourself, January 1st, what New Year's resolutions did you make? Full conscious intention of actually changing your life this year. And now ask yourself here at the end of September, did you succeed in doing that? Or are you, in fact, a prisoner? of forces beyond just your conscious intentionality. And I think Flash Forward, the TV series, grapples with that, as the book certainly did. But it's it's uh, terrifying to know. I mean, I, I don't like going to psychics or no. because I'm, I'm worried that I'll believe them, and then I have to grapple with what I think my future is going to be. So when these people see six months ahead, and there's a myriad of different images, obviously, uh, somebody sees a, a marriage broken up, right. another person sees, and then one person sees nothing, which... Yes. Yeah, John Cho doesn't see anything. John John, John Cho doesn't know if he's going to exist then. Uh, uh, six, it's, it's a tough thing to, to grapple with. You, This idea came to you, I've heard, based on when you were at a high school reunion? Absolutely, 20th anniversary high school reunion, and everybody was saying, if I'd only known then, in high school, what I know now, 20 years later, my life would have been better. And I, you just can't hear that as a writer and not think, that's a great premise. You've got to explore that. And the book uh, totally came out of that. This question of whether or not we can outwit our destiny, I think, is something that everybody wonders about. And you mentioned psychics. The big thing about you know psychics or charlatans is that... Uh, they tell you one thing, and the next guy who comes in, they've got the same basic script, and they give him a riff on that. You will find happiness, you will find peace, you will find this, but there will be bumps along the way. What happens in Flash Forward is your vision and my vision, if they happen to be of 20 years down the road or six months down the road, I'm on cue again. You see me, I see you. Yeah. They corroborate. How do we avoid that? That's then? right. And yeah. once it starts being this interlocking mosaic of corroborative visions, how do you outwit destiny then? See, it always comes back to me, if you'll forgive me, because I, I know you have an esteemed history in, in science fiction, but it always comes back to Star Trek, the original series for me, the prime directive, right? The prime directive is you, you can't go down, you can't change the future of a planet. You right. know, that's the one thing that you're not allowed to do. That, that people doesn't... have a right to have their own destiny unfold right. as they see fit. Absolutely. And, and if I change my destiny, there's no way it won't affect you know, in other, in other words, if I did, if I change it to make sure that we're not doing that six months from now, that's it's right. going to affect you. So that's right. I, there's no way to do it in isolation. Right? Exactly, and, and, and indeed, that's right. And do you have a right to say, well, it'll advantage me if I do this? even though it'll disadvantage a hundred or a thousand or a million other people if I don't do it. It's a really provocative question. How uh, particle physics yes. has something to do with all of this. Uh, why do you see science as such a fertile source for storytelling? Well, because science is what gives things credibility. We can actually ask ourselves questions and get verifiable answers. I can say, hey, I found this thing and tell you how to do the same experiment. And you can say, oh yeah, that actually is true, which separates it from mysticism or religion or anything else. And when I want to tell a story about a really big question, you know, hey, what if we could all see the future? I don't want you to be easily able to dismiss that and say, that's just fantasy. I want to say, no, 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 here is some good solid physics underpinning that. Now that it's a serious question, let's talk about that. On that note, the show has been compared to Lost. Yeah. I think it's better, but um, but, <laughs> I do but, too. but uh, but I mean, I know there's a lot of lost fans out there, but but it, 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 this one it seems less fantastical uh, and more relevant to what's happening in our world: war, terrorism, pandemics, stock right. market crashes, all the fun right. stuff that kids should be watching. Uh, to what extent do you see this story based in our reality? Yeah, it's absolutely based in our reality. That's the huge difference. What Lost did immediately is got all of its characters away from our reality to this fantasy island of. Uh, tropical climates and polar bears and and mysteries that you, you know, who knows what's going on there. This show is set in our here and now, and unlike any of, if lost or anything else, it's moving towards a definable date. The visions that people have in the TV series Flash Forward are of April 29th, 2010. That date is coming up very rapidly. We have made a, a promise, a covenant, 
to the viewing audience that if you stick with us till the end of April, we're really going to give you <laughs> answers, definitive answers. Yeah. And Lost never quite made that promise. Or if it did, a lot of people felt the promise was was broken as the seasons went by. Well, there was a yeah, there was a, a lot of promise, uh, and then it went crazy. Yeah, uh, you take uh, science fiction very seriously. I do. Good because uh, uh, you, uh, be, that's what I've heard, and and, and from our, our previous chat, it's a literature of ideas for you. But you've acknowledged that science fiction sometimes gets a bad rap, especially in the way it's portrayed in TV and movies. And you partly blame George Lucas of Star Wars fame for that. Yeah, I Why? largely blame George Lucas. Uh, we were making really good progress up to 1977. Movies like 2001, A Space Odyssey, clearly a cinematic masterpiece. Planet of the Apes, which was clearly social comment on race relations and uh, an anti-nuclear war film. And then along comes this film that's got robots and spaceships and aliens, clearly obviously science fiction in most people's minds. And it's a fairy tale, a long time ago in a galaxy far, right. far away about a mystical force and Ben Kenobi is a wizard and it blurred everything everybody's lines. Took us too far away from reality. It took us totally away from reality. It became that science fiction and fantasy became synonymous because of George Lucas. And fantasy is things that never could happen. Science fiction is things that plausibly might happen. Planet of the Apes could happen? Uh, Post-nuclear holocaust and something other than humanity might arise to take our place? Yes, I think absolutely. If we bomb ourselves out of the game, it's not the end of life on Earth. It's just the end for Homo sapiens. You've called this your novel and the show now an exploration of the question of fate versus free will. We've yes. been talking about that. Uh, of whether the future is as fixed as, as the past or, or whether it's, it is mutable. So what do you think on a personal level? On a personal level, I think that the actions I take every single day in my life define what my future is going to be. I think we're hardwired to believe that. We wouldn't get out of bed in the morning if we didn't believe we were make, weren't making a difference with what we did each day. But when I studied the physics of time and of consciousness, the actual scientific basis of consciousness, when I was researching the novel a decade ago, I became more and more convinced that we all know the past is immutable. It's fixed. You can't go back and stop the Holocaust or the Kennedy assassination or whatever. The future, I think, is just as fixed. It's like watching Casablanca for wow. the first time. You don't know how Casablanca ends, but it's still already absolutely written on the final frame of the film. So environmentalists would probably say we already do know uh, the future, but, but or some would. But, uh, but do you think it, it, then it is a blessing or a curse, back to the psychic, but on a broader level, a blessing or a curse to know the future of the planet? Well, the, oh, I think for us, if we, assuming that you actually could change the future, which is debatable. You just made the case you can't. I know, I know. Assuming <laughs> that you could. Right. Uh, if you could see the way the environment is going and you could see the way the political situation is going, that's the source of activism is people. You had Ralph Nader on the show in the hour before me. Yeah. The source of activism is apprehension about the future turning out to be an unpleasant place. And the reason we contemplate the future is so that we can take steps to make the future what we want it to be. And whether we actually have free will or not, the defining human experience is our belief that our actions make a difference. It's good to have you here. My pleasure. Best of luck with this. Congrats on its success so, Thanks, so far. I've been talking to Robert J. Sawyer, author of the novel turned TV series Flash Forward. It airs Thursday nights on ABC and uh, CTV's A Channel. Uh, Flash Forward, the novel, is featured on, actually right now on CBC's online book club this month. You can check that out at cbc.ca slash book club. And Robert with, was with me here in Studio Q.